song leading us this week in worship. I've never heard a better band musically. I've also um, never experienced more intimate worship. And I've never been around a better student body than the student body here at Cedarville. That's the truth. Thank you for the way you've responded. Thank you for how, you, how friendly you've been. You know, it's kind of a being from the South, Southerners are kind of uh, arrogant in one thing. We think we're the only friendly people in the world. And, and uh, that's not true because I have met some extremely friendly people this week from Pennsylvania and New Hampshire and uh, Massachusetts and um, even a couple of friendly people from New York. And I really have enjoyed just meeting you and the conversations I've had. You're so encouraging. I, I want to just one thing, if I could pinpoint something that has really stuck out to me, um, I do not detect any cynicism in the student body. And what I mean by that is I know that we tend to be cynical um, as Christians sometimes, especially being raised in the church, you can, uh, as you grow older, become cynical and critical and judgmental. And I'm sure that we struggle with those things individually, but I don't sense a spirit of cynicism. I sense a spirit of hunger for the Word of hunger for the presence of God and a desire to know God and make Him known. And I just want to boast in the Lord and say, I am so honored that I've been able to serve you. I hope I've served you well by the grace of God this week. And I just want to boast in what I see God doing here on this campus. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. It's been a great, great week. Um, if you have a Bible, turn to 2 Timothy. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we wrap up our fall Bible conference and if you're taking notes, which I always encourage people to do, the title of this message is Stronger Companion. Stronger Companion. While you're turning to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want to mention a few things to you because this is my last session with you today, and I've got to head back to Dayton and fly back home to the lovely south where the humidity is 1,000% and the weather is not nearly as beautiful as it is today. I, I, I think that the weather here today is tricking you. I think it's telling you I'm going to be beautiful and I'm going to be wonderful and it's setting you up for the fall. And it's setting you up for 18 feet of snow and a million degrees below zero. Because I was here, I was here one time when that happened. But um, a couple of things let me mention to you is a lot of you have asked me how you can keep in touch with us and keep up with our ministry. Our ministry uh, it's called Clayton King Ministries, but we refer to everything that we do as Crossroads Ministries. We have a, a summer camp with almost 5,000 kids every summer. We do mission trips all over the world. I have a coaching network. Actually, I have a Cedarville graduate in my coaching network where I disciple and mentor a group of 25 guys for a year. And I had dinner with him two nights ago. He lives not far from here uh, over toward uh, uh, Cleveland. I think. Um, no, Columbus. So I have a coaching network for guys. We have guys and ladies that travel and speak. Our ladies do women's events and marriage conferences with their husbands. We have several different guys that travel and speak. If you want to keep up with our ministry, if you want to find out what we're doing and pray for us or keep up with me personally or contact us, the easiest way to do it is just to type in uh, ClaytonKing.com. That'll take you straight to our ministry's website. You can also download our free ministry app. It doesn't cost a dime. It takes a matter of seconds to download. Go into your app store on your smartphone, um, or if you have um, a Samsung, your moderately intelligent phone. Sorry, I had to take one more shot. I'm just teasing. Go into your smartphone uh, uh, app, and at your app store, just type in Clayton King Ministries, and our app will show up. You can download that for free, and we have tons of great ministry content. Uh, our staff writes, uh, we blog on there, we write Bible studies on our app. Um, I have sermons there that are free, both audio and video, and you can get all of that for free. You don't even have to download the stuff once you get the app, it's free of charge. You can also keep up with me through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I just started doing Periscope, so I'm going to try to figure that lovely little beast out. And um, so you can keep up with us through that. I post prayer requests. Um, I post links to articles. I post links to sermons and content on our social media platforms. Um, and then if you would be so kind, especially the freshman class, the freshman uh, received a free copy of my book, Stronger. And everything I'm preaching this entire week comes directly from that book. So if you're a freshman or a fresh woman, you got a, see what I did there? Isn't that clever? I thought I would get a better response than that. If you got a, thank you, a courtesy. Um, 
If you got a free book or if you purchased a book this week, would you do me a favor? When you finish the book, would you go to amazon.com and write a review? Um, what that does is it helps people who may not be Christians who are searching uh, using different search engines. They may type in a word like uh, weakness or depression or grief or emotional strength. And the more reviews that are written at amazon.com for the book Stronger, the more it places it at the top of the list in those search engines so that hopefully people, especially those that may not know Jesus, can find that book and buy that book and hopefully give their lives to Christ and find peace and healing and strength in reading those words. So if you got a copy of the book this week, that would be a huge favor. And uh, I do have to leave after this service, but I can hang around for about an hour. So I'll be out in the lobby at my book table. If you want to get a book, that'll be your last chance to pick one up. Love to sign it, love to shake your hand, and uh, love to meet you. Thank you guys for having me. I, I really appreciate you guys, Dr. White, Miss White, your kids. It was great to be in your home. Um, you guys have hospitality down to an art, and I know that's just naturally who you are. And I'm not trying to embarrass you, Dr. White, but um, I told you this last night to your face. I want to say this in front of your student body here. Uh, I've met lots of leaders. I've never met a leader like you who, along with your wife, is so hands-on and so ministry-oriented, who stays after a service, who leads students to Christ, who prays with students, who has, who has such a heart for the development of their hearts. I honor you guys. I'm so thankful that God brought you to Cedarville for such a time as this. Thank you. Praise God for y'all. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing a letter to his young apprentice in ministry. And in this particular letter, as he closes out his thoughts for what may be his last letter written to Timothy, he says some things that deserve our attention. And I want to draw all of this back to a point, the point we've been trying to make all week together, that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness that we are not strong in and of ourselves, that our flesh is weak, but God is strong in our weakness through his Holy Spirit and by the gospel. Paul is an older man now in the final season of his ministry. As we've already looked in scripture, Paul bears on his body the marks of Jesus. He even says in Galatians six seventeen, one of my favorite verses, as he wraps up his letter to the church in Galatia, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. So at this final season of his earthly ministry, he is looking forward to seeing Jesus, but there is still work to be done. He's not finished. I believe if you could ask the apostle Paul what his ministry philosophy would be, he would probably say, if I'm not dead, God's not done. And I want you to say that to yourself. I want you to make that your ministry mantra. I would love it if this entire student body could adopt that motto, that vision statement, that mission statement. If I'm not dead, God's not done. If you still have breath, you still have purpose. If you're still breathing, you can keep going by God's grace. And as Paul wraps up this letter to Timothy, I want to read a few of these verses and show you how you can not only be a stronger companion to people in their weakness, but you can embrace a stronger companion in Jesus because at the end of the day, he will never leave you or forsake you. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You can hear the heartbeat of this weathered, scarred apostle. You can feel the years that have taken a toll on his body. I can almost see him in a jail cell where he had been arrested more than once, where he had spent many 
cold, dark, damp nights in prison. I can just see his, his, his withering hands. I can almost imagine what he looked like being chained to a Roman guard, thinking to himself, I cannot wait until Jesus calls me home. But until he calls me home, I will continue to preach the gospel. I, it reminds me, I want to show you something if I could. This, is, this Bible that I'm holding in my hands is my most prized earthly possession. I have some possessions that mean a lot to me. I have a pocket watch that belonged to my great-grandfather. I have, uh, I, the first time I met Dr. White, I was preaching uh, in Texas and I got to go to, to their home and have uh, dessert with them one night. And we started talking about old World War II memorabilia and your president pulled out a pistol, a, a Nazi pistol from World War II. I actually have a, a Mauser assault rifle that my great uncle took off of a Nazi soldier that he killed in World War II and shipped back to America. Those are some of my most prized possessions, but nothing compares to this Bible. I'm going to show you why I love this Bible so much. In the front of my Bible, and I, dude, those screens are gigantic. <laughs> is my head really that big in real life? Wow. Okay. This is a picture of Billy Graham. And I taped this picture in front of my Bible, and I'm not an idolater, and I do not worship Billy Graham, and I do not pray to Billy Graham. But as an evangelist, I've tried to model our ministry and our structure after Billy Graham's ministry. He's a man who has put a high value on integrity and character, and he's finishing well. He's not done yet. He's finishing well. And I always look at this uh, picture before I go up and preach, and then this next page, that this is what makes my Bible so valuable to me. Billy Graham signed it. That is Billy Graham's handwriting right there. I got to spend an afternoon with him in his home a few years ago. My wife was pregnant with our second son, and we spent um, three and a half hours in his living room with him. And I brought my Bible with me that day. It had been a lifelong goal since I had come to Jesus to meet Billy Graham. And um, he signed it to Clayton, keep your knees down and your eyes on Jesus, Philippians 1.6. And I, I sat there at his feet in his living room, and I just asked him question after question. And as he continued to talk, I just had this... I just had this moment where I realized I am, I'm with one of, these great, one of the greatest men of God that's ever preached the gospel in the twilight of his ministry. And I could, I could imagine him saying the same thing that Paul says to Timothy, the time of my departure is at hand. I asked Dr. Graham, I said, what do you look forward to most right now in life? And I thought he was gonna talk about his grandchildren or his great grandchildren. He said, I look forward to dying because when I die, I will finally be with Jesus. And I said, wow, that's, I mean, that's obviously what a great man of God or a great woman of God would say at the end of their life. And he said, and his wife was still alive when I met him. Ruth uh, died shortly after we visited Dr. Graham in his home. And here's what he said. He said, God has given me his presence. God has given me great friends. He said, but what's kept me going for so long is that God gave me a companion in my wife. And Ruth is the greatest Christian I've ever met. I can say the same thing about my wife. I'm thankful that God has given me a companion. And when I learned, when I went through that dark night of the soul in my life, when I went through a decade or more of depression and anxiety and fear, what I learned is, and I want you to remember this and I want you to write this down, that a companion is always better than an exemption. A companion in hard times is always better than an exemption from hard times. And what we want is an exemption because we're humans. I mean, it's human nature to want to take the easy way out. It's human nature to take the path of least resistance. And even Jesus in his human nature prayed to his heavenly father in the garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested and crucified. If there is any way that this cup can pass from me, please, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In our human nature, it is just natural for us to look for an exemption, but none of us gets an exemption from suffering and pain and hard times. But we get something better than an exemption. We get a companion that will stay with us through thick and thin. The reason why there is a valley of the shadow of death is that death casts a shadow on us, but in order for there to be a shadow, there must be a bright light shining somewhere. 
And the bright light that shines and casts a shadow on our broken, fallen world is the light of a God who says, I am Emmanuel, God with us. God is not distant. God is not outer space. God is not removed from our human experience. He was tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. He took off his glory and willingly came and took on flesh and became the God man so that we would know he understands what we go through. Paul is at the end of his ministry and he is looking forward to finally being reunited with Jesus whom he had met once face to face. But in the meantime, as he writes his final thoughts, some of his final words he'll ever pen before he dies, among other letters, he's not only looking forward to seeing his heavenly companion, but he is also thankful for his earthly companions. I want to draw your attention to this. Look at verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Demas, by the way, in case you're curious, is mentioned three times in the Bible. The first time he's mentioned as Paul's close companion. The second time he is simply mentioned. The third time Demas has walked away. He is a companion that abandoned Paul. He is a friend that did not stick closer than a brother. But even though a companion may leave you, and even though people will come and go in your life in different seasons, in different times, you've got one companion that will never walk away from you. Paul goes on to say this in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Do you notice how many people Paul is mentioning by name? He loved people. And if you don't, if you don't love people, first of all, you're probably not called into ministry. Or if you are called to ministry and you don't love people, then God needs to break you of your pride and your selfishness so that you'll begin to esteem others more highly than yourself. And I'm preaching to myself on that one too. Notice how many people he mentions by name. He knows these people. He loves these people. Some of them are still his companions in ministry. And the companionship that he knew, the brotherhood he experienced with his brothers, the friendship that he had known with brothers and sisters as throughout his letters, he mentions them one after another, after another specific details about their relationships, even mentioning items that he wants them to bring to him and visit them and see them. He is someone who has known true companionship, but he's also known what it means to be abandoned by those that love him. Verse 12, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. He wants something to read. He wants the, he wants the tangible tactile word in his hands. He wants to be able to connect with God through the written word. Alexander, verse 14, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Why do you need companions? Because people will oppose you. Why do you need real friendships? Why do you need stronger friendships? Because in this world, you are gonna have tribulation and nobody can live alone. Nobody can do life alone. You cannot live in spiritual isolation and ever grow in your faith with Jesus Christ. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. There is, listen, your faith, your faith in Christ is personal, but it's not private. My faith in Jesus is personal. I had to make a personal decision to repent of my sins and trust Christ and ask him to save me. But I do not keep my faith to myself and I do not live only to myself. I'm responsible and accountable to everybody in this room. If I go out today and God forbid, do something that would bring public shame and reproach on the name of Jesus Christ, you're gonna feel the ripple effects of that. We carry a great responsibility. We carry a great burden and we can't carry it without the grace of God and we can't carry it without the strength that we gain from being in community and the family of God with our sisters and our brothers in Jesus Christ. We need each other. He says in the next verse, verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Do you hear the groanings of a man who at the end of his ministry in the final season of his life is still remembering the pain that was caused to him by those he loved? 
He still remembers. God can redeem these kind of things, but they never really go away. And I did want to make that point. As we've talked all week long about pain and suffering and hard times and how God brings hope and victory through those moments, you will never get over these hard times, but by the grace of God, you can get through them. Someone asked me that last night at my book table. How did you get over the death of your father? That was her exact wording to me. How did you get over the death of your father? And I said, I didn't. And I never will. I will never get over my dad dying. I'll never get over losing my mom when I was in another country. I'll never get over that 12 year period where I preached a funeral every 16 months. I'll never get over that. It's part of who I am. It's part of my story. It's a scar that tells my story. I will never ever get over what I suffered through, but I will get through it and I will tell my story and I will be transparent and I will be vulnerable and I will share openly so that you can bring strength, so that God can bring strength to you through my story so that you will know you're not alone, that you're not the only one who's ever thought you were crazy, that you're not the only one who ever laid in bed at night and wanted to not wake up the next morning. To know that no matter what happens to you, what God is doing through you is more important than what the world is doing to you. I will tell the story. I'll never get over it, but I will walk through it with my companion, Jesus Christ. He says this, verse 17, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me, can we all say that word together? Strength. The Lord stood at my side. See, Paul did not get an exemption from hard times but he got a companion that stood with him. But the Lord, verse 17, stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. You see that? What have I talked about several times this week? When you see that phrase, so that, that's a purpose phrase. That shows you why something happened. That shows you God's sovereign plan being woven through this situation. Everything that happened to Paul, everything. I love his theology. Oh, I cannot wait to meet him in heaven. Everything that happened to Paul was for a purpose so that his message of the gospel could be proclaimed more clearly, more boldly, and more faithfully. Everything. Nothing is wasted when you give your pain to God, nothing. He can redeem everything. He says in verse uh, 17, the last sentence, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Paul had understood that a companion is better than an exemption. And he's ready to go. Now, you're a college student. Most of you have got a long time before your life comes to an end. But since none of us know when the end of the world may come, and since none of us know when Jesus is going to return, let's learn this lesson now so that if by God's grace you get to live to be old men and women, you will be as faithful to Jesus as Paul was. Now, I'm 42. And I'm, I'm anticipating living to be 100. That's my anticipation. I don't really know if I want to live any older than that um, because I don't want to, I, don't, I, want, I want to have a good quality of life, but it's up to God. I don't get to pick when I live or when I die. And my dream is to die preaching. I want to die preaching. I want to be on a stage preaching the gospel. I want to be in a room full of crowded people, a crowded room full of people. And I want to be landing the plane. And I want to close the deal in a way that I will only get to do it once. I would love for Jesus to take me home right as I am extending the invitation for people to get saved. It would be the most effective invitation ever given in the life of my ministry. Some of y'all are like, man, you are morbid. No, I'm just, I'm just thinking ahead. I'm a planner, okay? I don't know how I'm going to go. I have no idea. I mean, I... 
I could die today. I'm not anticipating it. In Jesus' name, I want to go home and kiss my wife and hug my kids and, and, uh, and see the sod that my wife and my kids laid in our yard while I was gone. Dr. White was telling the truth. My wife is incredible. Let me tell you how awesome my wife is. Not only does my wife lay sod, and sod, if you don't know, is like grass and dirt in big squares that you put down on the soil that won't grow other grass. Not only does my wife lay sod, not only is she a great writer, not only is she a wonderful mom, wonderful homeschool mom. She's also a great athlete. She's a great soccer player. She's a great basketball player. She is the best cook I have ever been around in my life. She's a great kisser. None of y'all will ever know that experientially except for me. But, but my wife, we were on a mission trip in the Himalayas and we were bombed. I mentioned this the other day. They were bombing us. I'm not kidding. We're in the middle of, of these people from across the river in Kargil, which is in North India. Uh, on the other side, these Muslims who are bombing every day across the border into India from the Pakistani side, they were launching mortars at our vehicle. And um, a good friend of Joy's was with us on that trip. His name is Chunks. He's, a, he's an executive pastor at a church in Charlotte. He was with us in the bus while they're launching mortars at us. And our driver, his name was Devon, and as the mortars begin to fall, he says um, for us to pray. He's like, pray really hard, and I'm going to drive really fast. And my wife looks at me and she says, are they trying to kill us? We had been married four months. We went on one of our honeymoons to the Himalayas and did a 200-mile backpacking trek to take the gospel to six unreached people groups and villages who had never had a copy of the Bible or heard the gospel. Now, that's how you have a honeymoon. We also went to Belize before that, but that one also counts. <laughs> so, as the, as the mortars are being launched, my companion, my best friend, my wife, my flesh and blood says to me, are they launching those mortars at us? And I said, yes. She said, are they trying to kill us? I said, yes. She said, cool. <laughs> she did. She said, I can't think of a better way to die than serving Jesus on the mission field with my new husband. <laughs> God may not give you an exemption from the bombs and the mortars and the emotional trauma in life. But he will give you companions to walk with you. He will give you friends to be with you. He has promised us, he has given us his spirit who will never ever break the seal that he put on our hearts in Ephesians 1. He will never leave you. It is better to have a companion than to have an exemption. And I love you, so I'm gonna tell you the truth one more time. The only prosperity you are promised when you come to faith is that you get Jesus. You get his promise of companionship that he will be by your side through the hardest moments and seasons of your life. I wrote this in my notes. The world says that hurting people hurt people, but the gospel says hurting people help people. That's what the world tells us. That's what psychology tells us. Hurting people hurt people. And it's true. I get it. I get it. When I'm hurting in my flesh, I tend to lash out. But look at it from a different perspective. Flip the lens and see it from another angle. Instead of your hurt causing you to hurt other people, look at your hurt as a magnet for God's help. Look at your hurt as a doorway for the presence of God to walk into your life in a new and tender, compassionate way. Look at the things that have hurt you as an opportunity for you to help others. Hurting people don't have to hurt people. By the grace of God, hurting people can help people. So harness your hurt as a source of healing. Don't waste it, harness it. Harness your hurt as a source of healing. I can't remember if I've shared this already this week. I know I shared it uh, with a few of you personally. My, my wife was abused by her dad for five years as a little girl. She has a compelling story. It's, it's breathtaking. And she decided when she came to faith in Christ, when Jesus rescued her from that abusive relationship and her mom divorced her stepdad because of everything he had done to her for five years as a little girl from age five to age 10, it hurt my wife. But now my wife, by God's grace, uses that hurt to help others and to heal others. Nothing is wasted. When my dad was about to die, 
that last night in the hospital room I spent with him. He woke up in the middle of the night and he said, you know what I was just dreaming about? And this story is in my book. It's one of my closing stories. It's where I learned this lesson about exemption and companion. He said, I was just dreaming about that time that you and I got lost in the woods and I knew exactly what he was talking about. When I was 10, my dad and I went to the Sumter National Forest in South Carolina where I grew up and we deer hunted and every year in September, we would go and scout out where we were gonna hunt and we would go look for deer sign and tracks and rubs and scrapes and my dad had killed some good sized deer down there and I'd never killed one down there and I was just old enough to begin to go with my dad. And so we went down on an afternoon, we probably got there a little after lunch and it was a really warm day in September. We took off through the woods and within a, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, we're, lo- we're just completely enjoying God's creation. Hot day, ringing wet with sweat. And then a few hours later, my dad stopped. He's dead in his tracks. He just pulled up and he stopped. And I was walking behind him and I almost ran into him. And I got this sense that my daddy was scared. And I'd really never seen my dad afraid. It's kind of a scary thing for me. He took off walking and we went straight up a lead. And when we got to the top of that ridge, he stopped again. And then we kept walking and about an hour later as his pace continued to pick up and I was getting hotter and more sweaty and more tired, my dad stopped again. He said, son, we're lost. I don't know where we are. We need to pray that the Lord will get us out of here. And in that moment, I felt a combination of two emotions. I felt panic. Oh no, what are we gonna do? If my dad is lost, we'll never get out of here. We're gonna die in these woods. There are tens of thousands of acres of of forest down here. There's nobody within miles of us. And as a 10 year old kid, the panic also creates scary scenarios. An animal is gonna attack us. We're gonna get eaten by a pack of wild wolves. Not to mention there are no wolves within 500 miles, but who knows when you're a 10 year old kid, exactly the geographical boundaries of a wolf. I'm freaking out. I am panicking. I, 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 I think grizzly bears are going to come out with a goatee and a helmet and they're going to beat us up and tie us up. And I mean, cr- creating crazy scenarios of panic in my mind. But alongside that panic was another reality. There was peace. I felt both at the same time. I felt the panic of, oh no, we're lost. We're going to die. And I felt the peace of knowing, but I'm with my dad. And I know my dad and I trust my dad and I believe in my dad and my daddy's gonna get us out of here. And so for a few more hours, we continue to walk. And when the sun set over the Western horizon, it began to get cold. It was early fall and it began to get really chilly and we began to get cold and our clothes were so wet from the sweat as they began to cool off, I began to shiver and I began to shake and the panic began to grow and the peace began to diminish. And it got so dark, we had a flashlight, but the batteries went dead. And as it got completely dark, I only had enough light to see one step in front of me where my dad's feet were. And I tried to stay one step behind him to step where his feet had gone. And I wasn't looking up, I was looking down at the ground. I was trying to put my feet in his tracks when all of a sudden my dad disappeared over the edge. And it happened so fast that I didn't even have time to stop. And I went off the edge too. And in that moment, just just go with me here for a second. That's descriptive of how you're gonna feel many times in your life. You're gonna feel like you have gone off a cliff. You're gonna feel like you've gone over the edge. You're gonna feel like you'll never be able to bounce back from that adversity. You're gonna feel like you're all alone and nobody understands and nobody cares and God has abandoned you. You are gonna have phone calls that rock your world. You're gonna have doctor visits where the news that you get are gonna, is gonna completely alter the trajectory of your life. You're gonna love people and they're gonna die. You're gonna love people and they're gonna get sick. You're gonna get sick. Something's gonna happen to you, not just once, but multiple times in your life that you cannot control because control is an illusion. And you're going to feel like you have gone over the edge. And when you feel like you are in free fall, you remember this, that your God has made you a promise that he will be with you. And let me tell you what happened in that story. 
That edge that we walked over was not a cliff that went down into a bottomless pit filled with tarantulas, clowns, and cilantro. (laughs) Because that would be almost as bad as H-E double hockey sticks. (laughs) No, the cliff that we went over was the bank two feet above the gravel road that we had been trying to get to for hours. When I went over the edge of that cliff, my feet hit the ground almost immediately. And the inertia of my weight propelled me forward and I fell on my hands and I felt gravel underneath my hands. And I stood up and my dad said, we found the road, son. The truck should be about a mile and a half or two down here. And my dad and I walked down that gravel road side by side. We found the truck and one of my most vivid memories of my life. Got in the truck and he turned the ignition and he turned on the heat and we backed out and we drove home and I sat as close to my dad as I could. And to this moment, I can still remember what he smelled like. And the last full cognizant conversation I had with my dad before he died, he said, I'll never forget you and I getting lost and being scared, but I had you with me, son. And as he tried to grip my hand, he could barely even move his fingers. He said, and I'm glad you're still right here with me at the end. Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. God is our stronger companion. And if you will submit all of your weakness and all of your pain and all of your suffering to him, he'll make you a stronger companion for others. Father, thank you for this amazing servant that we still look to today named Paul. Thank you for the way that he lived his life Thank you for the way that he transparently opened up and shared his struggles and his weakness so that we could gain your strength. And Lord, for this week, we bless your name for those who have been saved. We bless your name for those who have surrendered to a call to ministry. And we ask you, Jesus, to keep us faithful to you so that one day we can say with Paul, I'm ready. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. In Christ's name, we pray and believe. Amen. Thanks, guys, for a wonderful week. You are dismissed.